We're going to jump right in. So if you have a Bible, if you'll turn it to Mark chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 32. If If you don't have a Bible, you can listen along. Or there's also a Bible in front of you. If you grab the Bible in front of you, it's page 707. So it's easy to find. Page 707. We're in Mark chapter 1, verse 32. We are going through the book of Mark from beginning to end. And what Mark does is is this bottom portion here. He paints a specific portrait of Jesus. But in this first section that we've been in, in, he kind of lays out this unexpected Messiah, that that he is the Messiah, but he comes um, in a way that that, um, doesn't necessarily meet the expectation of what people thought. And we're kind of going to kind of conclude that this week. We're going to take a few weeks and focus on uh, our mission to make Jesus known, that's the next three weeks, and then we're going to return to the book of Mark and uh, continue in it. But for this week, starting in verse 32, it's a little bit of a, a review of what we did at the end of last week, starting in verse 32, it says this, that evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and the demon possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, remember this is at Peter and Andrew's home, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. The next day, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon, that's also known as Peter, and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone's looking for you. Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Verse 40, a man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Filled with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand And touched the man, I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately the leprosy left him, and he was cured. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priests, and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your healing as a testimony to them. Instead, though, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. Yet the people still came to him from everywhere. Amen and amen. May God's word just kind of settle in our hearts and stir his spirit in the transformation this day. Mark lets us know from the very beginning, verse 1 here that he is writing to tell us about the good news that Jesus is the Christ, also translated or known as the Messiah. However, the Messiah that he begins to give a portrait of is not the Messiah that people expected. It's not what they thought. It, It did not meet their expectations. First, He unexpectedly was more than just a prophet, more than just a mere man. They expected God to choose one, but they expected God to choose one from among us. They never in their wildest dreams thought that God himself would be the one. Second, he unexpectedly called people to himself that seemed like a poor choice for the promised one of God. He chose people like you and me. Third, he unexpectedly came with an authority over Scripture, authority over the human body, and even an unexpected authority over the spiritual world. And as our Scripture will reveal today, there's another aspect of Jesus that was puzzling, and that was his unexpected approach to sharing his message. Twice in last week's passage, and and we see it again today in verse 34, Jesus forbade the evil spirits to talk of who he was. They knew who he was. And he told them to be quiet. it, It is as if he wanted to keep his identity a secret. 
<clears throat> after, <clears throat> excuse me, after talking about this long day, remember, it started on the Sabbath morning with him teaching, then he cast out the, uh, the evil spirit from someone, then he went to the home of Peter and Andrew, he healed Peter's mother-in-law, and then when that day was done, the sun had set, then the crowds came because the Sabbath was over, and what he did for the two individuals, he did for the crowds, and he healed late into the evening many people who were sick and many people who were demon-possessed. It was a late night. Picking up in verse 35, though, Jesus did not do the sensible thing and sleep in. At least sensible to me. No, he gets up before everyone else. This is an agricultural society, so as soon as the, the sun begins to give any light, they are out and about. So when it is still dark, somewhere between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m., he goes out of the town and finds a solitary place to pray. Now, this, this is huge. It's easy to miss. I would have missed it if some other smarter people hadn't seen this pattern and pointed it out to me. But Mark highlights Jesus praying three times in this letter that he writes, once in the beginning, once in the middle, and then once at the end. The first time we find right here in Mark chapter 1, it's after this long Sabbath day, and he gets up early, gets alone in the dark, and prays. The second time you'll find in Mark chapter 6, he finds out the news that his cousin, John the Baptist, also the forebear to his own ministry, has been murdered. He tries to get away to kind of process that with the Father, and the crowds follow him to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, and he has compassion on them. Spends the rest of the afternoon sharing with them into the evening when they should go eat for themselves, and then he feeds the 5,000. He dismisses his disciples as they go out on the Sea of Galilee themselves, and then he goes and dismisses the crowd doing even more ministry into the evening, and then he gets alone in the dark in a solitary place to finally be with the Father. And the last time you'll find in Mark chapter 14, the Garden of Gethsemane. This is, it. This is a day that not only the preceding day, because it was a celebration of the Sabbath, and he knew what was ahead of him, the cross. Right in the middle of this, Jesus gets alone, gets to in a dark place to pray. Isn't that interesting? Jesus withdraws at the toughest times to pray. It did not seem inconvenient for him to secure a quiet place and talk with the Father. Jesus, if anyone had no time to pray, it was Jesus. Talk about a busy schedule. But even the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, the great I Am model that when life gets the busiest and becomes overwhelming, the priority of prayer actually moves up to the top of the list. In essence, Jesus modeled where there is a will, there is a way. And the more you think you don't have time for it, the more you need it. And I'm preaching to myself more than anybody else here. <laughs> now, in the midst of this pause of life and ministry, Jesus is interrupted. Some of his disciples, led by Peter, hunt him down. And they exclaim, everyone is looking for you. They're implying a little bit of annoyance because they thought that Jesus was failing to capitalize on some excellent opportunities in Capernaum. We got them where we want them, Jesus. Peter's intentions seem good. The master was losing a precious opportunity and he must be brought back. You got to strike while the iron is hot. Instead, though, Jesus doesn't take this as great news and just responds the way they thought he would, but he models an unexpected approach to ministry. The crowds waiting anxiously at Peter's house have already heard the good news. They've seen it authenticated by his power. Now it is time to move on to others. Jesus had a mission, and it was related to proclaiming the good news rather than just drawing a crowd. 
He did not permit popular acclaim to change his priorities. Then Mark tells us, starting in verse 40, that as they begin now their journey, not towards Capernaum, but towards other villages, a man with leprosy finds Jesus. Now, we don't know how he found him, but obviously he knows about Jesus. You can tell from the context, Jesus is the one he's seeking out. Jesus is the one he expects to be able to do something about his leprosy. Perhaps this man, like so many others, if you remember the scripture preceding this, when Jesus heals that morning on the Sabbath, word spreads throughout the region, but especially that town like that. Everyone knows about it. And so that evening, everyone who is sick or demon-possessed or knows someone really, brings them to Jesus. But it would not be so simple for this leopard. Leprosy was an unattractive skin disease, much they did not understand, for which the Bible itself had prescribed a quarantine from the rest of society. In Leviticus 13, this will come up on the screen, 45 and 46, it says this. It says, the person, this is out of uh, Hebrew scriptures here, Old Testament, the person with such an infectious disease must wear torn clothes. Let his hair be unkept, cover the lower part of his face, and cry out, unclean, unclean. As long as he has the infection, he remains unclean. He must live alone, and he must live outside the camp. This man couldn't just waltz into town and show up at someone's home uninvited, even if it is to be healed. But somehow he's heard about Jesus and he's heard that he's not in town, but outside in the nether regions, if you would, and he tracks him down. And he approaches Jesus with humility. See this on, as he comes on bended knees. He approaches Jesus with a measure of boldness. The word that we read in the New International Vers, uh, uh, Version, it's translated beg, but it's really more in lines of he implored or beseeched. It was a bold request. Now notice the wording here in verse 40. He says, if you are willing, you can. If you are willing, you can. He believes Jesus can heal him. The only question is, is Jesus willing? Now, this is much different than the prayers which we often, and I mean me when I say we, give, which is the reverse order. We often go to God and say, if you can, then you will. But there is a huge difference because when you pray, if you can, then you will, in essence, you're testing God. You're asking for the magician to show up. If you can do this, God, if you are really God, if you are really real, if you really love me, then you will. Ta -da -da. <laughs> However, this man is not testing God. He's showing faith. I know you can. And if you're willing, make it so. This man believes in Jesus. He may not fully understand who Jesus is, but he believes in his authority and power. Then, moved by compassion, not pity, not guilt, or annoyance. Three things, by the way, that I often respond to people out of. But he responds out of compassion. He touches the untouchable. This is probably... No doubt, the first touch this leper has had in a very long time. He probably believed nobody would ever lay a hand on him again. Especially in this time of ignorance of what was happening in the body. And Yet Jesus' touch showed that he was not bound by rabbinic regulations regarding ritual defilement. Jesus' love and compassion for the human being in front of him was greater and more important than the religious rules and practices and false beliefs of that day. Both this touch and Jesus' authoritative pronouncement, I am willing, be clean, constituted the cure. It was immediate, it was complete, and it was visible to all who saw it. But 
once again, Jesus unexpectedly takes a different approach to this miracle than most would have expected. He strongly commands this man. And as a matter of fact, the, the word used is, is actually so strong that it, it reflects anger. Now, there's nothing in the context that suggests that Jesus was angry at the man. However, he strongly commands him that even though he's been radically and miraculously healed, to tell no one except the priest, except the Jewish priest. For the law set out in Leviticus chapter 14, Leviticus chapter 14 prescribes particular sacrifices by the priest on the leopard's behalf who was cured of leprosy or of a, of a skin disease. Just as importantly, the cleansing of the leper was an undeniable, though, messianic sign that God was working in a new way. There's only twice in all of the Hebrew scriptures where someone with leprosy is healed. And when, and when the Hebrew scriptures, which we call the Old Testament, points towards the Messiah, this, this age of miracles, of, of good news being preached to the poor and of healing the leopards is spoken of. And thus, when he goes to the priest, notice in, in, in the passage here, Jesus says, I want you to go, I want you to go to the priest, right? And at the very end of verse 44, he says, as a testimony to them. Who's the them? The priests. What's the testimony? that there is one powerful enough to heal the leopard. We have verified it. We have verified he was sick. We have verified that he is now clean. And in that verification, we verify that one had power to do it. And what's interesting is that this claim of him being clean is going to set up a very interesting process in the next section where the, this Messiah gets unexpected opposition. It's unexpected because it would seem that the very people who said, yes, he in fact did this, he yet, yes, in fact, showing the power that the Hebrew scriptures say what the Messiah would do, would resist Jesus as Messiah. But you'll have to come back at another date to hear that. What's important to note here in Mark is that this unexpected Messiah is about to run in an unexpected opposition because he does things with an unexpected approach. Now, there's a lot that I can teach in this pastors, as, as a pastor. There's, there's, a, there's a lot of good stuff here that I can really emphasize and I can dig out. Obviously, I could, pr I could teach on the prayer habits of Jesus. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a phenomenal, how he's an example of that and how we should pray and so forth. I could, I could preach about the faith of the leopard. It's huge here. His approach. I could preach on the love and the compassion of the Savior. Or perhaps I could preach on the ceremony cleansing laws of the Old Testament and how the cleansing of the leper, the leprosy represents sin and how Jesus comes along and cleanses. I could, I could teach a, hopefully a decent message on that. And all these things are, are there in the passage, absolutely. However, the common denominator of all these passages isn't in e any of those individual things. The common denominator, which Mark seems to be stacking up one after the other, is that Jesus had an unexpected approach to ministry. Each of these things highlights that. He commanded the evil spirits to be quiet and not to tell others of who he was. He avoids the crowd who marveled at his power. And he goes to new places that never even heard the message. He commands the healed leper not to tell anyone, even though he's been miraculously healed. That is the common denominator. That is what Mark is developing in this passage. Now, I have to take a little sidestep here and kind of full disclosure. Okay, honestly, as a pastor... I would have made the opposite decision of Jesus in every single episode. Uh, now, part of that is that I suffer from pride. I do. I have, an, I have a huge need to be approved of and be loved as, as many people as possible. It's a terrible beast. I'm glad I'm not alone. <laughs> but even if I were able to keep that beast in check by the power of the Holy Spirit... I would still assume that the best thing for God's kingdom was for Jesus to become as well-known and passionately followed by as many people as possible. 
and to strike while the iron's hot. Jesus, however, clearly resists this game plan. His call, he tells them, is to tell people about the good news. This is the good news that the kingdom of God is at hand. It is here. Why? Because the king of the kingdom is among them. I am here. And that complete reconciliation to God is possible even for the lowliest among them. That is his call. That is his mission. Now, there's another passage I really uh, uh, like that also talks about this unexpected approach, and it's John chapter 2, verses 23 and 25. You see it up there on the screen. It says this. This is what John writes. He says, Now while he, this being Jesus, was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many people saw the miraculous signs he was doing and, check this out, believed in his name. Yes! They saw the miracles and they were like, we believe, we're on board. What do you want us to sign up for? What do you want us to do? Right? I mean, it looks like a big win. And he's in Jerusalem. This is the, this is the place that the Messiah is supposed to establish his kingdom. And they're, and they're, in essence, ready to conquer Rome and follow him to do whatever he wants them to do. It looks like he's won. Or at least he's way on his way. He's, if he was running for office, this would be the time. But notice verse 24, but Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all men, and that word would be men and women. He did not need man's testimony about man, for he knew what was in man. In essence, Jesus understood the human propensity that we have to follow the man of the hour, the one who's offering the latest life enrichment plan. He knows that for every diet today, there'll be another diet tomorrow. For every great leader today, every man of the year this year, there'll be a different man of the year next year, or woman of the year for that matter. He understood that drawing crowd does not mean much. For the crowds are fickle, and they stay only as long as you fill their insatiable appetite to feel good, to be part of something cool, to be hip. Jesus had come not to whip a crowd into frenzy and use that political clout to advance his personal agenda. There's people all throughout history, both some for good things and some for bad things. That is how it's done. And, and if you, the bigger crowd that you gather, the more the people in the crowd are convinced you must be right. And I know you're right, because when I look to our right, there's a lot of other people on my right that say you're right. And I look to my left, there's a lot of people on my left that say you're right, so you must be right. And yet history has shown? No. In which case, one of the most right people in history would have been Hitler to name one among many. Jesus had come to share good news. Now, the miracles were not the center of this ministry. This is important to note. They were not the center of his ministry. Now, they, did, they, did, they were an example of his compassion for the people he met, and they were absolutely an example that what he was teaching, they authenticated what he was teaching by showing the power that he could do in miracles. But ultimately... They were not the center of his ministry. What Jesus wanted was the crowds to follow him because he is the life, not because he would improve their life. Let me say that again. Ultimately, he wanted the crowds to follow him because he is the life, not because he would improve their life. For those of you who were with us this Wednesday and we talked about meditation, that's a sentence I might meditate on. He want us to follow him because he is the life, not because he would improve their life. Jesus knew that those who believed simply because of the miracles 
would soon lose their fervor and turn away. Just like if you have a health club membership and you actually go, you know the crowds in January will be gone in March. <laughs> and that's about true of any movement, political or otherwise. Many of us come to church because we believe it, or we hope, it may fix something that is broken in our lives. If we're honest, if we're honest, the attraction really wasn't God, but it's our desire to have a better life. Now, if he or the church can do that, I'm in. It actually is not hard to grow a church or any religious organization for that matter. You just got to find a way to help people feel happier. And if, if you can figure out how to do that, whether it's, you know, zippy music or, or funny teaching or, or, I don't know, great prizes, <laughs> then, you, then you can grow a church. You can, you can grow a movement. The problem is, of course, that Jesus did not put much credence in this. And when we do, we miss the very mark that he gave his life for. Now, it's true. God does improve our lives. That's true. And he does heal us. He does transform us. But that's not the basis for his existence or his purpose for our lives. His plan is to make us his own and to make us an instrument of his hand for his glory. Let me say that again. His plan is to make us his own and to make us an instrument of his hand for his glory. The good news was not that God sent Jesus and through him he put together the ultimate self-help program that results in a happier, healthier, and better you. This is the, the kind of gospel that Paul would warn you against. Stay away from that gospel. Stay away from the, any kind of good news that says, listen, I got a plan, a self-help program. It, it happens to have Jesus as the center. It happens to talk about God. It happens maybe to even uh, happen in a church. But ultimately, it will result in a happier, healthier, and better you. Isn't that good news? No, that's a sales pitch. It's a sales pitch. The good news is that Jesus came to preach was that he was the promised one. He was the solution that we needed from the very beginning when we were separated from God. And it was through him that reconciliation with God would be provided. For it would be his blood that would be shed for the forgiveness of our sins. And though he would die and be buried. And he was in the grave three days because legally, science was not what it is today. So they could think you're dead, but not really be dead. So the law was, after three days, you were legally dead. So that's why he waited three days before he showed up after Lazarus died. And that's why he stayed in the grave for three days, because then he was legally dead. And so when he was legally dead, he rose from the grave and showed not only does he have the power and the authority over death itself, but that we who are reborn by the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives can also rise from death, death of self to life in Christ and a relationship with God for the purpose of glorifying him. Now, I can get myself in big trouble if I go too far down that road and tell you what I think. So let's go to the scriptures. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This is what Paul writes. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. It'll come up on the screen here. Paul writes this. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel. I want to remind you of the good news. I preach to you which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel or good news, you are saved. This is it. This is the authentic deal. 
if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. In other words, if you, if you attach yourself to some other version of the good news, you're wasting your time and, quite frankly, a really nice day. For, he goes on to say in verse 3, what I received, I pass on to you as of importance. And here's what I received. Here's the good news. One, Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Not only did He die for our sins, but the Hebrew uh, Scriptures, the Old Testament, said He would do that from the very beginning. That He died, and specifically for our sins. That He was buried, and that He raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, showing He has power over death. Now notice this. Not only does He want you to receive that, but He says, you know this is true because, verse 5, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time. And this next sentence is important. Most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. In other words, if you doubt this, don't just ask this special group of 12. Ask any of the hundreds of people that Jesus appeared to after he was dead. It's verifiable. Go, just go talk to them. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born, referring to the fact that he persecuted the church before he encountered Jesus and therefore became a proponent of the church. Notice the key here. The good news is that Jesus did for us what we could not do ourselves and that he is the center of the good news. So here's a question I have for you and me. Are you going to follow Jesus because of what he does for you or because you love him for who he is? Are you going to follow Jesus because of what he did for you or because you love him for who he is? There's a difference. It's the same difference that every man or woman with a lot of money or great beauty or any great advantage of life always ask themselves in the back of their mind with someone that they may be marrying or get involved with, do they love me or is it just because I have money or just because I make them look good or just because of, their, of my fame? Do they really love me? And in essence, Christ is saying the same thing. People who are attracted to my power, I don't give much credence to because it's about them. I want people who love me. In John 17, 3, this is what Jesus says. He says, now this is eternal life. He's going to define it for us. Now, if you'd asked me what eternal life is, I'd probably give you some kind of definition of the pearly gates. You know, and you, or eternal life is that moment you die and you go to the gate and you answer, you know, the multiple choice questions that Peter gives you and the, and the gates open up and you walk in and the angels sing, oh, right? And, you know, and, and then, you know, that's eternal, that's eternal life. Jesus has a little bit different definition of what that is. He says eternal life is this, that they may know you, he's praying to God, the Father, the only true God and Jesus, the Christ, whom you have sent. Eternal life is knowing, it's about relationship, knowing God, especially as he presented himself in the form of Jesus Christ. Eternal life is not simply the reward for being good. It is a never-ending relationship between God and those who desire to know and be with God. It's not, it's not really just a choice of, you know, what is the best thing? eternal theme park, right? Where I, I just, I want to go to the best, I want to have the best eternal vacation that I possibly can. Heaven. No. Eternal life is a place that those who, who want to and desire to be in a love relationship and to know God can do that for eternity. And anyone who doesn't ultimately want to know and love God will not like heaven. Because it won't be about them and their desires and their agenda and all the things that they love to do. It's going to be about Him. That's eternal life. 
Jesus was not trying to teach people a new philosophy that he wanted people to adopt or, or gather a crowd that would buy into his way of self-improvement. He was inviting people to make a decision to know him. That's what was important about what he said. That's why he didn't stick around just to get the crowd more and more into a frenzy. He wasn't, now listen to this, he wasn't trying to convince everyone. Now this is especially important if you're a person, like we're going to talk about the next three weeks, who, who desires to make Jesus known and to share him. He was not trying to convince everyone. He was simply extending an invitation to everyone so that the willing few who would respond and abandon all to be with him would do so. He knew that not all would be convinced because it's not a matter of convincing someone just to believe. We know this is true because we believe a lot of things we know are good for us and we don't do them. It was an unexpected approach by an unexpected Messiah. So let me ask the question again. Are you going to follow Jesus because of what he does for you or because you love him for who he is? Because if you're only interested in what he does for you, let me save you some time. You're wasting your time. Because eventually... God will stop doing the things that make you happy and start doing the things that make you holy. Eventually, he'll stop doing the things that make you happy and start doing the things that make you holy. Now, don't confuse holiness in your head because a lot of times we get this picture of this perfect, righteous, never make a mistake person. Holiness means set apart. Set apart for what? As an instrument for God's glory. Ultimately, this will lead to a joy that, that is greater than happiness, but that's a result. The goal is to know Him. Now, I, I want to pause really quickly and just kind of clarify, okay? None of us, and including especially the guy on the stage, right? None of us, as soon as we hear this truth, go, oh, well, Jesus, you can have it all. The disciples who are present aren't willing to do that. After three years of living, I mean, even in the midst of this, they're like, Jesus, we need to go back to Capernaum. No, that's not why I'm here. And then what do they do for the next three years? They argue about who's the greatest among them. It's still about them. <laughs> it's still about who gets to be, you know, on his right hand when, the, when he, you know, the conquering king conquers. And then they all run at the very end when things turn south. So, so, so do, I, what I'm not saying is you got you, if you're not all in, then get out. I'm not saying that at all. I am saying, though, the issue is your willingness to grow and to seek Him rather than you're just here because you're hoping something's going to solve what's broken in your life. And as long as God conserves that, you're in. And as soon as He stops doing that, you're out. You might as well go out. Because that's not what following Christ is about. There's a passage in the Bible where Jesus says, the faith of a mustard seed. All you need is a faith of a little mustard seed, which can blossom in this huge tree. He can work with that. In, in essence, what I'm telling you is this. The willingness of a mustard seed. It may not be much. You may be like, God, you know, I really like you to solve all these things. But I don't want it to be just about that. I'd really like to get to know you and have more and more of you become the center of my life and less and less of me. Whatever little willingness there is there, he'll take it. He can work with that. But it's got to be an issue of willingness, not just an issue of, oh, here's another way I can improve my life. Ultimately, ultimately this seeking, this little willingness will bear fruit for the one who truly desires to know Jesus rather than just benefit from him. And that is Mark's invitation. That is what Mark is highlighting here. Jesus isn't interested in just people who want to be part of the crowd and, more importantly, be part of the benefits. He's interested in people who want to know him. Let me pray for us. Father God, I thank you for the heart of a father, the heart of a heavenly daddy who just says, I want my children to want to hang with me. 
I want my kids to know me and want to hang out with me. Forgive us, Dad, for making it more complicated than that. Forgive us, Dad, for um, taking you for granted and it chalking you up to just, you know, the man with the wallet who can get us what we want. Forgive us. And would you take our small amount of willingness to God, no matter how small it is, whether it's a mustard seed or you've grown it even bigger than that, Would you take that small amount, meet us where we're at, and begin to grow on us more and more love of you and not just what you do for us, that we may experience life that is truly life. Will you do this work in us that we cannot do ourselves by the power and the love and the compassion and the example of our Lord and Savior and Master, Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.